from violent sports to mystery plays. Today's list definitely proves that medieval times were anything but boring. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Hive. I'm your host, Rachel Fisher, and today we are counting down our list of top 10 medieval traditions that will leave you speechless. It, things got weird. Number 10, starting off strong with animal court. That's right, in the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were, of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that, so they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament which must be observed by God but not only God the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union that's right the tickly boo the boo boo the jiggy that yeah, yeah that's right your parents your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the Middle Ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trafia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never-ending rave. Initially physicians thought folks were just stressed out so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point they were like oh, we better cut this off and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray, and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in, and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you... I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with a whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next like women's fashion we just we've done a lot of stuff anyways in the Middle Ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face why no idea maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead who knows but either way it was a big deal so what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows hairline and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like 
their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting, though, is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors. And therefore, relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold, he died that way, it was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease, and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding, or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh, wow, what's happening? Their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the Black Dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds, which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good, otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round, so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title, I have to say, football, because football 
ball had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football. You could use any part of your body to to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either, because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. Anyways guys, that was our list. Honestly, I used to play soccer when I was in middle school and I don't think the game has changed that much. Girls are violent. Thanks for watching everyone. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, follow, subscribe, comment, do the thing. I've been your host Rachel Fisher and until next time folks, stay sweet bees.